Wonderful, wonderful. Well, here we are. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the Business Use Cases Breakout Session of the PAAV Summit. My name is Jackie Erickson, and I will be moderating today's session. And this session is the last of this particular summit, so I do believe that they've saved the best for last. Um, just a brief background on myself. Um, I'm a Pittsburgh native, and I'm truly passionate about seeing all these emerging technologies um, come into society safely. Currently, I am the director of policy for Optimus Ride. Optimus Ride is an all-electric autonomous shuttle company. And I am also a returning uh, speaker for the PA AV Summit. I've been on the circuit of the AV Summit since uh, 2017, since the early days. So it's glad to be back. Um, one thing I do wanna do is take a moment and uh, before we get started into some of the housekeeping items, I want to acknowledge PennDOT. I want to acknowledge Michael Baker and all the folks behind the screen um, that they have done a fantastic job of pulling this together. It's not easy in a virtual setting. It's really, really hard. So for those that are familiar with the clapping setting on the bottom right hand side, can we just do a little bit of a clap for our friends at, uh, at PennDOT and, um, and Michael Baker? Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, I am required to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, so uh, as we all know, these sessions are being recorded. They will be available later this year. Um, you will also see that your microphone has been automatically muted to reduce background noise. So don't worry if there's construction going on or if the kids are coming in from school, we can't hear it, thank goodness. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you're gonna see the general chat and you're also going to see the Q&A. I do encourage folks, I know we're in a virtual setting, but you know, if you see somebody you know and you haven't seen in a while, just chat them, say hello, you know, engage a little bit, um, ask a few questions on the, on the Q&A side of things as, as well. Uh, we wanna make this as interactive as we can, uh, as we are still in a virtual setting. Um, and then actually, I'm trying to think if there's anything else here, I guess from a formatting standpoint, so folks are aware, is we're gonna have the speakers do brief presentations and then we'll go into some Q&A. All right, but before we get started, I do want to just give a little bit of background on this particular session. Um, so we wanted to take this opportunity with business use cases and look at it from a different approach of how to integrate autonomous vehicle technology uh, differently, you know, getting goods from point A to point B. You know, we've heard, um, we've heard on the trucking side, we've talked about what's happening on the highways, super exciting. Um, but, today, but in this particular session, we are going to stay on the road for a little bit when we hear from Neuro, but we're going to go also on the rail side of things. And this is a great opportunity to also look at other industries and how they're working with automation and autonomy. And so especially with Pennsylvania being um, a, a legacy state when it comes to the rail industry, I'm really excited to have our friends at Wabtech be here to present. But even before you get to you know, successful businesses, we need to have, in every region, thriving ecosystems from the business community. And that starts at working at the local, state, and the federal levels. And so, you know, so this kind of leads into our, our first speaker. And so I'm so very, very, very excited uh, to be able to introduce somebody who is highly re respected across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, who is a dear friend of mine. And so I'm proud to introduce Matt Smith, the president of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce. Matt, take it away. Thank you very much, Jackie. And, and we're going to run through a, a couple of uh, slides that, that we've used for um, the study um, that I sort of want to use as the anchor for the discussion. But as, as Jackie said, you know, we uh, in the Pittsburgh region have identified um, the autonomous mobile system sector as one where you know, before we did the study, we thought we were really well positioned. And so we wanted to take a deeper dive into um, you know, how well positioned the region is and what, particularly on the policy side and the political side, what do we need to uh, do to really accelerate the growth of, of something that we intuitively thought was already really strong in our region. And so we joined, as you can see from the cover uh, page there, 
Uh, we join with our partners at RIDC, the Regional Industrial Development Corporation, um, to undertake a study that, that we call it Securing Pittsburgh's Breakout Position in Autonomous Mobile Systems. And uh, I should note it was funded uh, by the Richard King Mellon Foundation. And so it's a perfect example, <clears throat> we think, of the Pittsburgh model of public-private coming together, and in this case, the foundations um, supporting us and investing in this study. But it, as you can see, we had uh, other partners um, on the initial steering committee of the study, the Pittsburgh Technology Council, uh, Carnegie Mellon, our colleagues at the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, which is our economic development affiliate at the Allegheny Conference, as well as industry uh, represented. And, that, and that's really one of the key points we've made consistently when we've been discussing the study. This is really um, an industry-led effort, and, and we want to make sure it, it remains that way, and, and industry's role in the study in moving it forward was really critical. Um, so on the next slide, we, we go into a little bit around the purpose um, of the study, and you know what we really wanted to do was convene, um, examine the sector, define it, um, evaluate threats and opportunities, and, and put an initial strategy blueprint on the table that we could move forward. And for me personally, one of the early objectives was to hopefully identify this sector as one of the Pittsburgh region's big opportunities, um, as other regions in the state have done when we talk to state and federal policymakers. And so on the next slide, you can see yeah, we really are starting out from a, a very strong position. The, the top line result is that the Pittsburgh region right now is one of the top centers um, for autonomous mobile systems um, in the country. And you know, we have an ACE card and a key anchor, as you can see in CMU, uh, which the study identified as the number one academic center uh, for research and talent impact. Um, the study also identified the fact that we're number two to the Detroit Ann Arbor uh, region in the concentration of big global players um, in this particular sector. So, um, you know, it also identified right now we have around 161 million in direct local, state, and federal tax revenues from this sector. Um, so, we're already seeing a very positive and robust impact um, from the sector in the Pittsburgh region, as, as we're positioned right now. On the next slide, you can see. Um, that we really have a diverse set of companies um, within this particular sector. We're diversified across market and industry technology systems. You can see there from commercial transportation to logistics and supply chain, um, aerospace, military and defense, and, and even in the agriculture um, space. You know, this is a, this is a um, set of companies that is very diverse and, and we do not um, have all of our eggs in one basket as it relates to this particular sector. So in the next slide, it just further really amplifies this point that we have a very diverse um, set of companies operating in the autonomous mobile systems vertical uh, verticals right now in the Pittsburgh region. Um, and so we're really operating from a very strong foundation as it relates to this particular sector. On the next slide, uh, we go into a little bit uh, uh, around what the study told us about the size and scope um, of the opportunity for private sector growth. Um, as you can see there, um, it's estimated to be a, a, a north of $1 trillion uh, in total market size. So uh, the study told us that if we're able to just capture 1% of that uh, global share, uh, we're talking about $10 billion um, an estimated impact um, and over 5,000 jobs uh, over the next five years um, in the Pittsburgh region. So even capturing a very small percentage of the overall play uh, would have a huge impact on the region's economy and, and on our population as well. And so on the next slide, we, we start to pivot um, a little bit uh, from the good news story, the, the fact that we're really well positioned, we clearly have a very strong hand. We have great assets and, and we see a huge opportunity here. Um, the bad news, uh, the flip side of that coin is that our regulatory environment right now um, is not where it needs to be. Um, we currently don't have a, a path to testing and deployment um, in Pennsylvania. And that was one of the big impediments cited uh, by the study. 
Um, in fact, uh, many of our companies here are testing in other markets and, and actually not even testing um, within Pennsylvania. And, and you know, there's there's one particular um, organization that's that's testing um, from the western part of the India of Indiana uh, to the eastern part of Ohio, but then stopping uh, at Pennsylvania. So the the regulatory um, impediments are right now within the Commonwealth are real. The other uh, big uh, point that we've we've made and that the study demonstrates is that other regions um, are investing um, in this sector and they're competing with us and and that's one of the points uh, we've made with uh, particularly our state uh, policymaker partners the the fact that you know as you can see on their mass robotics uh, Silicon Valley robotics network M city um, again in Michigan to the tune of of north of 26 million uh, drive Ohio investing 45 million. Um, mass robotics, as, as I said earlier, is another one. I mean, these are these are states that have identified as we have that this is a significant opportunity, and they're making these investments. Um, and, and from our perspective, you know, we, we talk a lot about competing uh, with some of the southern states, Tennessee, Florida, Texas. In this case, you know, we're really facing direct competition from our neighbors, um, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. Um, as noted. And so this robust investment is something that other states um, are doing. They see the opportunity in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I think is, is it's really important that Pennsylvania recognizes that we're in this competitive landscape. And so on the next page, we talk about a little bit uh, uh, related to what are the opportunities for, for the funding. Um, as many of you know, the EDA um, has opened up a process for upwards of $100 million uh, in federal funding for regional innovation cluster um, opportunity. There is relief dollars, uh, both at the local as well as the state uh, level um, that could be tapped into for this particular ecosystem. And so the competition is fierce in, in this space, but um, significant um, opportunity is out there to drive some of this money um, into Pennsylvania and specifically into the Pittsburgh region to support this sector. And so what's necessary, we go into on the next slide a little bit of um, the priorities that, that are necessary in moving this forward is, is noted, um, advancing the, the regulatory environment to facilitate testing and deployment um, is really critical path number one that the study identified if, if we wanna capture the manufacturing opportunities. Number two, uh, creating um, a coalition of industry, civic and economic development stakeholders who identify this as the um, opportunity for the Pittsburgh region and get up every day thinking about how they can advance the ecosystem. And as noted, number three, mobilizing the significant state and federal support um, that's out there to, to grow this cluster. And so let me just take a little bit of a deeper dive on the next slide into, into what that means. Um, as noted, there's, there's a critical uh, need for a uh, state level autonomy program to position the Pittsburgh region for growth. And the study identified three particular areas where that could be um, really helpful. Number one, um, on the innovation ecosystem side, um, and, and that you know, is, is noted in, in number three, strategy number three, um, excuse me, that, that could really mean um, a focus on coordinating regional economic development partners like RIDC, for example, to make sure that the investments are being made um, in sites that, that would facilitate the growth of this um, ecosystem and industry. Um, on the second part there, industry growth, you know, that's really around making sure that, that we scale this across the region. It's, it's an opportunity that isn't um, simply um, one that is uh, within Allegheny County or the city of Pittsburgh. We feel like this is an opportunity for the entire region and uh, industry growth gets us to that point in terms of taking advantage of the full supply chain. And then the third part there, as everyone knows, talent is an issue in every industry. Uh, this one is no different. And, and we wanna make sure that we work with the building trades, with our universities, with our communi community colleges and every uh, local university and school out here in the Pittsburgh region to make sure that this is, this is advanced. Um, also, the, the other point I want to draw out on draw out on this slide is with regard to strategy number five. Um, you know, we think that's a great um, point and a, and a very important opportunity for us to take advantage of, and, and that involves really creating the demonstration and testing 
infrastructure assets to support industry scaling. So that may mean partnering with some of our public sector or quasi public sector partners to make sure that when they're thinking about mobility and access, this is one of the areas that they're thinking of and, and potentially investing in some demonstration projects. So on the next one, I'll just work through this quickly. Um, this really lays out all of the action items. I won't uh, take you through everything, but as I, as I noted at the outset, strategy number one is really being in a position where we can advance a state level autonomy program to position the region for future growth. And so on the next slide, you know, what does that mean? Uh, or excuse me, this, this one um, in particular, I wanted to note because of the partnership that is out there. So when you look at what the next steps are coming out of the study, uh, we're working on creating working committees that will um, help move the ball forward in each of these areas. So infrastructure development, business sites and facilities, the public policy and regulatory side of this is absolutely critical. And um, you know, we work really well in the Pittsburgh region with our partners um, in collaboration, and, and we think this will be no different. And, and we're really looking forward to working with all of the uh, stakeholders that you can see up there on your screen. And so lastly, I just want to uh, note, you know, this is really a huge opportunity um, on the next slide where if we convene stakeholders and act together, um, on these initiatives, we can really move the ball forward uh, in a really significant way. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to Jackie and looking forward to the discussion today in the Q&A uh, part of the session. Now, thank you, Matt. That was that was really a fantastic presentation. I do want to note a word that has been consistent throughout the summit is collaboration and what needs to happen uh, to to collaborate between industry, state, regulators, economic development. So I think the approach that the region is, is taking is, is really good to see some of these reports come out. And I know it's taken quite some time. So kudos to, to all of those uh, involved. Great. Um, for anybody who has questions for Matt, you can put those in the, in the Q&A. But we are getting ready for our next presenter. Milan Karuna Ratna, who is Wabtech's Director of Advanced Technologies and Applied Innovations. Milan, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Jackie, very much uh, for the uh, intro and thank you for the invite to be here. Clearly some really exciting stuff going on and uh, Wabtech's gonna, you know, really excited to be a part of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time telling you about Wabtech, our company, our industry a little bit, and, uh, and also talk a little bit about some of the some of the big vision pieces that we uh, we have and and where autonomous technology can can play a role. So if you go to the next next page, please. So you know when it comes to rail, we are a global leader in in rail technology uh, across the board, and we have deep roots in technology innovation and deep roots in Pennsylvania. Uh, our founder at George Westinghouse started Waptec uh, every company in Pittsburgh, and and you know it's amazing to see the evolution of the technologies and how Waptec as a company has grown to what it is. Uh, most recently, you know we we had two big acquisitions: Fabley Transport uh, out of Europe, uh, really focusing in the transit side of things, so really opening up that aperture for components in the transit um, space. And also very recently, GE Transportation, uh, which is where I came from now. It's running on almost 13 years in the industry now uh, I've been in. And this was where we were bringing that locomotive OEM into the mix of the portfolio. And, and what's really exciting is that this new app tech has really grown into what's on the right side of the page. It's a good mix of that physical and digital emerging technologies across the rail transportation uh, ecosystem and supply chain. Um, most recently, you might have heard we uh, leading an innovation in, in renewable technologies and our fully first of its kind, fully battery electric locomotive uh, was completing testing out in California um, and, and really pushing the boundaries of that technology. And in fact, we had our first you know official sale of that um, uh, locomotive uh, uh, to a customer. And just to give you a sense of the breadth of the locomotive fleet that Waptech has produced and put out into the world, we have roughly you know, 20, 23,000 locomotives running worldwide, right? So just imagine those type of assets bringing in uh, types of data for, for all sorts of analytics and, and intelligence that could be built. You know, one fifth of the world's freight is moved by a Waptech locomotive. So when I you know, say that, the ability to impact uh, and, and do good in the world is, is, is big and that, that's exciting to us. The, the bottom right section is really our, our, our play in the software space and our digital electronics and, and software services that go throughout that freight logistics uh, supply chain. 
from the time a, a, a container comes into the port of LA, WebTech has a, you know, a product called Port Optimizer that helps bring visibility and planning and uh, coordination to, to best facilitate you know, freight coming out of the port. As that container makes its way onto a train, you know, our locomotives are designed to haul that train in the safest, most reliable and, and fuel efficient way as possible. As that train makes its way into you know, a yard, we have you know, software solutions to help optimize how best to, to manage that type of goods. And then finally, as we get into some of our first last uh, in the short line side of things, we have transportation management systems to, 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 to provide a, a, our railroad customers that kind of ability. So a really nice spread of, as you look at the freight rail logistics supply chain, pockets of technology that we have. And, and that really leads me to one of the initiatives I want to kind of highlight um, that WAPTEC has been pushing this year called uh, Freight 2030. You go to the next slide, please. So, uh, you know, if you think about it, um, today in North America, rail moves about 40% of ton miles of freight uh, in, in, in North America, but makes up less than 2% of greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted from the transportation sector, right? So it's a more efficient and, and, and cleaner mode, and that's typically driven by the steel on steel, right? Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the friction and the efficiency in that context and how these trains are run. In addition to that, you know, as freight is starting to, you know, grow and, you know, folks like us are having a higher demand on from the consumer side of what we want and when we want it, you know, we are seeing that more of that congestion of, of movement of freight in and out of centers, ports, uh, you know, getting into, into um, in, you know, congested areas, especially around um, neighborhoods. And, and this is where rail is a much safer mode of transportation as well. So if we're more efficient, cleaner, and safer. The question is, what would it take to, to move more onto rail, right? What, how do we address that, that, uh, that topic? And it's a complex uh, question to answer, by the way. And that's what really helped kind of launch our Freight 2030 vision, where we were looking to partner with Carnegie Mellon, you know, the leader in, in AI and automation and, and these systems, and our partner agency in Wyoming, uh, largest short line uh, in the world and partnering with uh, their one of their divisions here in, in Pennsylvania. And the notion of this vision was, you know, what would it take to really go and, and build that zero emission battery or hydrogen type, type locomotive? I know we're only making 2% of that emission, but, you know, it's important to, to keep driving that forward in terms of clean energy. But that directly ties in with the second piece, right? What does it take to move more onto rail? Right, and, and I have a slide that's coming up that, that starts to unpack that, a very complex piece. And then and sticking with the safety culture of our industries, how do we make it safer? How do we push these, how do we push these three, things, three things forward? And how do we take some big swing initiatives to really try and, and get us there? And as you can see, if we're successful, it has the opportunity for some pretty large uh, impacts right, across the board. If you go to the next page, just to highlight a little bit on the, um, on the utilization side of it, right? Because that's that's where I spend most of my time um, currently. And and it's it's a complex equation. It's not one thing that you do that all of a sudden you're moving more freight uh, on rail, right? And it and it reverberates down that supply chain ecosystem. And the way we we look at it, you know, we see it in kind of three categories, right? Right now is how can we better optimize our our current heavy haul operations? These big trains moving from terminal to terminal, point A to point B. How can we help our customers move most efficiently? Uh, safely and reliably, right? And then as you get into rail type operations, the way, way these trains moves, they move in blocks of operation on the on the physical rail network, right? And you you need to get authority to move in certain blocks. And there's a lot of initiatives going around, around um, how do I increase the density? How close can I run these trains next to each other? If I can run these trains closer to each other, I can increase the capacity on that network. And there's a lot of effort going also across the pond in Europe with an initiative called Shift to Rail over there, where they're looking at advancements in signaling technology to be able to try and increase capacity by, by 30 to 40 percent, right? So, you know, what could you do there to help, you know, run these networks uh, more densely and in a safe way, right? But that on itself is not enough because, you know, just because you have more capacity on the network, you, it doesn't mean that you're going to get this flow in. That takes it to the, the second point, right, which is kind of terminals and yards and, and cargo visibility across our network. Um, a good example I always use is if you're catching a plane in a long distance and you're doing, a, uh, you know, you have one or two stops, and I hope you're not taking trips at two stops because that gets terrible. Um, but as soon as you come out of your plane, you know, you know, you got 45 minutes to catch your next next one. You, you, you come out, you find which, you know, terminal you're supposed to go to, and you jet to that terminal and 
hopefully that plane's leaving on time and hopefully you make it right it's the same thing when it comes to breaking and making trains and the, and except instead of people you got your containers and freight that need to go to its final destination so as these trains come into these terminals how do you help you know you know process them faster more consistently have them in safe operations get them out reliably get them out to meet that the next train it needs to uh, needs to go to it's the same concept of these airport terminals because at the end of the day that's what the the our customers customers their shippers are looking for right is that is that consistency in in and service and quality and the last one is is growing that first and last mile operation and this is very different definition to my fellow panelists mike here on the first and last mile but our first and last mile is 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 uh you know with our short line uh, railroads right and these think of these as the veins that feed some of the main arteries in in how we uh in how we move across uh the board and they are di interacting directly with their shippers and customers right so what would it take for us what type of technologies what type of operations could help lower those barriers of access to rail uh, for these shippers. And, and this is the three stages you know, of, of approaches we're looking at. And, and we're trying to think big, right? Um, how do we do it differently? And this is where I think our partners with Carnegie Mellon and Genesee in Wyoming are so important to kind of get together. And, and, you know, uh, and that's why we're hoping to launch this, this institute uh, in Pennsylvania to, uh, to go after uh, trying to introduce these technologies to the industry. So, uh, I think that's all I had. Uh, one more slide. I think it's just a close up. Yeah, it's all I had. So looking forward to the conversation and any questions uh, you may have. Jackie? Great. Thanks, Mon. I think that was great. The way that I learned about Freight uh, 2030 was watching the news and seeing um, the, the release in the articles with different local elected officials, you know, from Devin Davin at the at DCED, my former boss, U.S. Senator Bob Casey, some folks at the local level. So again, going back to this, enabling technologies into communities takes a whole collaborative approach. Um, so thank you for that for that presentation, Milan. And so we go to our next and I guess final presentation uh, for this one. And I'm and I'm so excited because I've been watching Neuro for quite some time. Um, Sorry if you've heard the noise in the background. Um, it's been really exciting to see Neuro take a look at all these different verticals. And, uh, you know, I'm really thrilled that we're able to have uh, Mike Blank, Neuro's regional policy lead, come in and brief us today. So, Mike, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, you know, I thought you were adding sound effects uh, to our ve vehicle when uh, when I heard that in the background. Yeah, so no, my it. mic is not automatically, uh, you know. <laughs> turned off. So you're going to hear stuff. Sorry about that. Go Great. to it. Mike. Uh, well, my name is uh, Mike Blank and I'm uh, the regional policy lead for Neuro. Um, you know, thank you for having me on the agenda. Uh, Neuro is a robotics company and our mission is to accelerate the benefits of robotics for everyday life. Um, our first approach to tackling this challenge is through autonomous vehicles. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll, uh, that highlights our R2 vehicle um, you know, we have a fleet of on-road, fully occupantless and autonomous vehicles that are designed to deliver everyday goods to consumers in a way that's quick, affordable, and most importantly, safe. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll address this now because I know a lot of people tend to ask the question about uh, whether or not the vehicle is actually smiling at you uh, right there on the bumper. And uh, yes, it was specifically designed that way because... Uh, you know, in a different way that uh, Milan mentioned, we do interact directly with customers. Um, and so that is part of the, the design. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, our design um, is, is really focused on safety. Uh, and when we talk about safety, um, you know, traditional vehicles, um, they need to think about safety and comfort of occupants, right? And so vehicle designs today are really you know, cup holders, radios, things like that. Um, you know, that's th those are added comforts, and you're thinking about designing a vehicle with airbags and 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 for passengers. When you take that away, you can completely redesign a vehicle, and that's what Neuro's strategy here has been. Um, and it allows us to not think about safety of occupants first, uh, but to think about the safety of people outside of the vehicle first, right? And that starts with our narrower width. Uh, you know, a narrower vehicle is going to be more uh, unlikely to hit a uh, pedestrian or bicyclist on the road. Um, and just in general, it's going to be narrow uh, by making it narrower and uh, smaller. It's going to be lighter. Um, you know, you see vehicles today, they're getting 
uh, much larger, they're getting heavier. Uh, we're going to take the opposite approach. We're going to make it smaller. We're going to make it lighter with safety. Um, you know, if you look at the front end here, it's it's specifically designed to be pedestrian protecting. Uh, you know, in the event that uh, an accident would occur, uh, we're designed specifically uh, to take that into account first. Uh, you can look at the top with our sensor stack where it's a 360 degree view. Um, and that uh, allows even for redundant uh, and simultaneous views in all directions. Um, and then obviously you've got the, the curbside doors uh, that are curbside so that people that want to access their goods or deliveries don't have to go out into the road. They'll be right there on the curb. Um, you know, and importantly too, and I know uh, it was focused on earlier, but we are an electric vehicle uh, and that is, uh, you know, comes with a number of benefits in terms of lower emissions, not only uh, CO2, uh, but others associated with uh, um, the ICE uh, motors. Um, you know, some other things I want to note here um, is that the vehicle, if you look in the, in the bottom right hand corner, uh, the max speed is 25. Uh, we do travel between the 20 and 25 mile range. Um, and so that makes us a low speed vehicle at the federal level. Um, you know, we are a motor vehicle. We often get confused with the personal delivery devices that are located on sidewalks or bike lanes. Uh, we are not a PDD. We are a, uh, motor vehicle and we are in complete compliance with motor vehicle safety standards, uh, enforced by NHTSA at the federal level. Uh, we actually received exemptions, uh, I believe last year, um, for things like our rear view mirrors where we, uh, that's a, a requirement at the federal level to have mirrors on your vehicle. Uh, we applied for an exemption that said, look, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. There's no occupants. Why would we want to have mirrors in here? Um, and it probably even adds additional safety by not having, you know, a six or eight inch mirror sticking out the side of the, the vehicle. It makes it even narrower and safer. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, our, that's our vehicle. Um, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk next, if you go to the next slide, a little bit about why why we're focused on delivery. Um, why are we not looking at passenger and freight? Or why is this kind of our first, we're a robotics company. Why are we focusing on a delivery, an autonomous delivery vehicle? Um, and if you look at like the statistics on delivery today, um, it's still pretty much the same way that we were shopping about 50 years ago. Um, you know, there's obviously e-commerce and a lot of those deliveries, but that only makes up about 10% of uh, the retail industry today. It's still 90% 90, 90 of what you're doing is, or, is, is local commerce, going to stores and running errands. Um, and that's something that uh, we've looked at uh, in, in further detail. And you can see on this chart here is that we spend a lot of time just running errands. Uh, most people think they own their car uh, because they're going to go to and from work. Uh, the reality is that's only about 25% of what you're using your car for. 43% uh, is for shopping and errands. Um, and that's really where we want to go and focus as a company and say, look, how do we give people more time back? Um, how do we make it and design a, a system where uh, we're taking people off the road, uh, therefore not putting them in, in harm's way, and they can stay at home with their families uh, while a vehicle can deliver goods to you? Um, and, um, you know, that's really the, the heart of what our, our business model is. When you talk about our use case or what, what, what's, our, what's our purpose and mission, that's really where we're focused and, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, if you go to the, the next slide, I'll highlight um, a, a study that we did um, that, um, you know, it's not only about giving people more time back, but it's also about uh, just safety in general. Um, and then, you know, I got into a, a little bit in the description of the vehicle uh, but we worked with the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, and they have a number of safety experts over there, and they have a number of safety models uh, and algorithms, algorithms that they can use uh, uh, to produce reports. And you know, we asked them to look into, you know, really, what is, if you were to replace traditional vehicles in your you know, crash models or accident models and with a uh, zero occupant vehicle like Neuro's R2, and you were to run those simulations again, uh, what would kind of what would happen? What's the outcome of that? Um, and you know what what we saw is that uh, you know we there was a um, about a sixty percent uh, for every mile of driving replaced by the, the zero occupant uh, vehicle, uh, the risk of a fatality and injury was reduced by approximately sixty percent. That's extremely significant because if you compare that compare that to what happened with airbags and the introduction of airbags into vehicles, that that was a 30% impact. 
right? And so what, what they're coming out with in this study and, and what they're talking about is basically double the impact of what a, uh, an airbag would mean uh, in terms of safety in vehicles. Um, and, and what that really tells you is that, you know, road safety isn't just about how you drive. Um, it's also about the types of vehicles that we have on the road uh, and what's inside those vehicles. Uh, and, you know, Neuro's strategy here is basically say, let's, if we don't need somebody in a vehicle, let's take that person off the road. Uh, and then secondly, you know, you've probably heard this and I'm probably, you know, at the end of the uh, a, a autonomous vehicle summit, the last speaker to go. And you guys are probably waiting for me to talk about how, you know, autonomous vehicles can make the roads more safer. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that multiple times already. But what we've said is we've gone an ex extra step there and say, yes, there's all sorts of safety benefits associated with autonomous vehicles. Um, but uh, we basically said, you know, because there's uh, autonomy, uh, we can rethink, redesign the vehicle for safety. Um, and there's those additional benefits that are out there. And that's what this study really goes after um, is to, to really capture, um, you know, what's in the future. Uh, and we think that's in, in safety design for vehicles. Um, and so I, I'm happy to stop there and we can uh, roll into some, uh, some Q&A, Jackie, if you'd like. Well, thank you so much, Mike, uh, for that really interesting presentation. And actually, I do want to start off with you. Uh, so you can take a sip of water while I ask this question, because this is about business use cases. We under, want to understand the business. The tech is cool, but we really want to see where is this going to move forward, especially in some of these traditional industries. And Neuro has really, you know, accelerated itself from a starting with the partnership with, Gro with Kroger and doing grocery, Domino's food delivery, as we all know. Um, and then, you know, looking at partnerships with FedEx, uh, CVS. So, what can you tell us from a business standpoint as, you know, as Neuro has gone in to work with these partners um, and, and, and go into different verticals, what have you learned? What can you share? Uh, sure. So, you know, yeah, as you mentioned, we, we're partners with uh, uh, some l large companies. There's FedEx, there's Domino's, there's Kroger, the world's largest or the largest U.S. Uh, grocer um, and, and several others, uh, Walmart's in there as well. Um, you know, if, if I go back to 2018 and we ran a pilot in Phoenix with um, with Kroger, Fries is the brand name there. And, you know, one of the things that we, we learned um, after that six months, we operated on the road uh, with um, you know, on the road and uh, with a perfect safety record. Um, you know, we did learn like, the important part here is if you the difference between testing and then actually like deploying and getting those pilot or real world experiences is you get real customers and you get real reactions and you know one of the things that we learned uh from that was out of there's the design of our vehicle um you know our, our one we had designed doors and the way that the doors were lifting and opening um that sometimes people were taller our customers might have been a little bit taller than we anticipated right and so uh you know we we had to redesign the doors um, you know, there was also the, the height of uh, the delivery area was actually a little bit too high for those with uh, in uh, a handicapped or in a wheelchair. So we were able to work with uh, people in that community and really design the vehicle in a way that was, um, you know, much more uh, accessible. Um, and that kind of led to design changes uh, going into our R2. Um, you know, I think the user experience too, we found out that, you know, we thought that we could just have the vehicle show up on the curb, uh, wherever we thought was appropriate, uh, but didn't necessarily take the, con the consumer's perspective of where they wanted the vehicle to arrive either by their driveway or somewhere around and creating that user experience, uh, was another, uh, uh, uh learning point as well of allowing, you know, maybe in the future, we'll allow people to choose where the vehicle, uh, will, will arrive on their curb. Um, but from that, we, we basically, we learned a lot about the, um, the demographics, the types of people that were interested in this. Uh, you know, it's actually slightly different from the regular customers of a, a fries, right? There's a subset that was actually very interested in, um, and, in, uh, in grocery delivery and autonomous vehicles and people thought it was cool or people was kind of like, you know, not having a driver, uh, or, Hey, do I tip this person or not? It was, there was a certain reasons that we learned about what our customers really wanted. Um, and that, and not only that, but there's also, um, just the infrastructure of, of, um, of cities and, and, and the kind of different aspects of that. And that really led to us, you know, testing in Phoenix and we gathered all that data that we kind of got from that pilot 
and you know reapplied it to various other cities. Okay, we're going to make these changes. We've learned this about our customers. What else are we going to go do, and where are we going to go do that? And that really led us to our uh, Domino's uh, deployment in Houston um, that uh, that we did there um, earlier uh, uh, this year. And so, um, yeah, I think it, 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 it's it's really the I think the important part here is in the AV sector is going from that testing phase, the ability to have that uh, deployment uh, capability to actually really learn, uh, interact with customers, find out what they what they want, what they need so that we can uh, either change our business models, change our product, uh, or potentially go to, to new places that we didn't uh, consider before. No, that's that's great feedback. Yes, there is what, you know, even at Optimist Ride, we've learned that, you know, you can test, but, you know, the customer feedback is so important. So, I really appreciate those those insights. Um, so I'm going to move over to to Milan because we've we've heard a little bit about you know safety throughout the day, and and Mike addressed a neuro safety approach, but we don't hear much about rail. So because this is hosted by PennDOT, Milan, can you tell us a little bit more? You know, the auto and rail uh, regulations are probably a little bit different. Um, can you can you tell us from your perspectives how these how regulations have an impact on Web Web's tech Web tech's business model? So um, one of the core, you know, foundations in, in our industry, in the rail industry is safety, right? And um, it absolutely impacts our business model and how we take solutions to market um, the, and, and, and how we approach it. What's the go to market? You know, how do we integrate it? And so on and so forth. In fact, I think the, the, the strong culture of safety uh, in our industry and the close, uh, you know, collaboration with the, the FRA um, to safely introduce these new technologies into operation is is a strength, right? Because we're working off of a, a platform of, of kind of um, uh, strong focus to make sure that we can we can introduce these type of things in, in a safe uh, way. Case in point, um, uh, PTC, positive train control, right? Uh, which was a critical, is, think of PTC as, you know, a safety overlayer of all the tracks, um, you know, across the network. There's 140,000 track miles in the U.S. So just giving you a sense, right, of our customers' access to rail to move freight from point A to point B, and it's it's a safety overlayer that's kind of designed to help prevent train to train type collisions, um, uh, over speed. So if you're going over speed and you're going to de derail, it's a system that is if you are going over speed, it's gonna it's gonna stop you and take actions. Uh, work zones, you know, if work is happening in certain areas, that system will know where that work is and not, you know you know, avoid trains from coming into that or operating in a way and it's not supposed to. And and movement through switches that aren't improperly thrown and similar um, alertnesses with the uh, from the driver, right? Those are all safety items that were driven through regulation. It took a long time to to for our customers to invest in and, and get out there. But man, I think that that is a key differentiator for us as we look to, you know, leveraging this network to move freight in, in different ways uh, and, and leveraging these technologies um, because that that's that's a key foundation right and from a business model perspective why that's important is we have to take into account the integration of these solutions with existing operations and i you know when we talked earlier i kind of highlighted there was a uh, the ceo of one of the class ones and i was in a conference like this listening to him and then he said something that really stuck with me he goes you he's like we have to uh design the plane while landing the plane I can't stop uh, operating the way we need. And you know, for my team, who you know, our, our job is to my my team, the Advanced Technology Group. You know, we try and think two, three years out about what's coming, and and that really stuck. And I went back and I told the group there because that impacts how we approach investment. That impacts how we what we would call a proof of concept or a minimum viable, right? To get it out, how do we test it effectively? We can't tell we can't tell our customers to stop operating. I want to go try something in those areas. So from a from a business model perspective, that's that's key, right? And also baking in the 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 the, the product strategy, the time, the resources to make sure that it's meeting those safety compliance items is, is is vital. And that goes true with any of the products we put, right? Software, physical products, um, uh, that is really core paramount to the industry here. It's fascinating. So positive train control, that might be something that we consider in the overlay uh, this overlay in our in our industry I, yeah that's it's really fascinating the safety, the safety overlay um you know and, and it took a long time to implement too right and that was and it was it was driven by you know yeah. a regulatory piece 
That's really great. It reminds me of a positive trust balance approach that uh, Professor Copeman from CMU used to talk about, more of a philosophy of safety of, uh, rather than more of an infrastructure safety. But I think it's along those lines as, as well. So, um, so no, that's really fascinating. And I hope our folks at, at PennDOT heard some of that, because I think it is good to pull from different industries as, you know, auto is taking a look at, you know, a bunch of different uh, approaches, especially from an emerging technology standpoint, what's safe, you know, what are safe for the vulnerable road users. I see that we do have a question related to these vulnerable road users. And I know Mike addressed a little bit of that in his remarks as well. So we're going to shift over from the safety perspective and go back to the community and economic development perspective. So Matt, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. Um, because a lot of conversation uh, throughout the summit has also been related to um, to workforce. So here's here's the question. So you, you talked about this strategy uh, to advance a state level autonomy program to position the region and the region is southwestern Pennsylvania for future growth. So so how does the innovation ecosystem, industry growth and, and talent kind of connect to all of this? You know, how are you engaging labor? You know, what is the feedback that they're giving to you? Can you expand on that? Yeah, sure, Jackie. I mean, on the, the ecosystem side, one of the key things that we've wor worked really hard on is creating uh, and building an identity um, for the region as a leader in the autonomous systems um, hub and sector. And so, you know, when you when you think about it, you know, and we've talked to state policymakers and, and you know, my former colleagues in the state house and the state senate, we want to make sure that they're thinking about the autonomy opportunity in Western Pennsylvania beyond autonomous vehicles. As, import, as important as um, the companies that we have located in, in Pittsburgh are, you know, this is really a much broader play around robotics and AI and supply chain and advanced manufacturing. And so we want to make sure that the identity is reflective of that broad opportunity. Um, and that sort of rolls into the the other category of of making sure that from the industry side that our assets here, as I said earlier, that our sites are ready uh, to take on this investment, that we have the infrastructure, the test tracks uh, to make sure that that we're an attractive region uh, to make this kind of investment. Um, so we've talked to the partners, as I said, from RIDC, from uh, the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance to make sure that uh, when we're communicating with our county economic development partners, that they're being uh, prepared, they're prepared as much as possible to receive this investment, to catalyze this investment. And then on the labor question, you know, I think that that is a really, um, you know, critical part of the overall talent um, equation. As I said earlier, you know, when we think of talent in this particular sector, we're, we're not just talking about computer science, engineering grads, uh, from the University of Pittsburgh or, or Carnegie Mellon, um, you know, even though that's an obvious strength for the region, you know, what we're really talking about is as we pivot from what we hope uh, and, and what we hope we're able to do is moving from an R&D intensive um, industry to one that is more production oriented, one that's manufacturing oriented. Um, and that's where we think that the talent in the workforce training uh, will be so critical from our building trades partners, from our community colleges, um, from various other trade schools in the region. And, you know, for us, working with labor um, on this issue is, you know, really important for the critical path. And, you know, we just, you know, I'm um, happy to share this with anyone who would like it. We uh, worked with Ken Broadbent, who is the leader of our local steam fitters union, um, out here and, and Kenny submitted a piece uh, to the Post Gazette talking about the opportunity uh, that exists in, in this sector. And uh, we don't look at it as, you know, I, I, I saw the question come through and I, I think it's a very fair question. When our partners from the labor community hear autonomy, um, you know, we want to make sure that they're not automatically thinking about a net job loss. And, and we're very cognizant of that. And I think, you know, Milan talked about greater utilization, uh, for example. There are going to be jobs created uh, through the supply chain enhancement that involve uh, technicians and assembly workers and manufacturing uh, that, that right now we're not even able to sort of sketch out. And so uh, we want to make sure that labor is, is not only at the table um, in these discussions, but, you know, really feeling a full um, it feel, feeling as a full partner 
um, in the effort here, because that's been uh, something that throughout the Pittsburgh region's history, we've uh, taken very seriously and, and we've really worked hard uh, at developing that business labor partnership. And as you said earlier, Jackie, you know, one of the key words uh, really is collaboration. And, and we view our labor partners as a very, very key collaborator in this effort. That's no, that's great. Um, you know, and I just recently listened to a podcast from Argo AI's director of special operations, Alex Roy. I'll, I'll just give him a quick shout out because he was talking about the mission specialists um, that are trained to, to drive and, and test these vehicles and the numbers and the type of the amount of focus, um, time drivenness, deterred, like there are characteristics in other people where you don't have to be a, you know, a software engineer to be involved in this industry. So I think educating folks on the labor side of what is needed, where gaps can fill in, I think is, is really important. Um, I want to be mindful of time, but since we're talking about communities and ecosystems, um, Neuro had a fantastic announcement with the state of Nevada. And I should say, I have been a fan of Nevada for many, many years. When I first went in uh, to Nevada to try to um, put some last mile delivery robots on, on their sidewalks, it was Governor Sandoval who had a statewide innovation initiative. And it was following the economic crisis where he said, we don't want to just be casinos. We just don't want to be, you know, liquor distributors. We want to have a wide portfolio of different uh, industries so that when an industry crash, when things crash, they're not impacted because they received probably the worst downfall when it came to the to that economic crisis in, in, in the Obama administration. So, but what I've seen is that they have done a tremendous tech attraction strategy. And so, Mike, I'm going to let you just talk briefly in like two minutes, if you, if you can. How, you know, how did those conversations go with Nevada? Um, Go Governor uh, Sisolak is no longer there. I'm sorry, Governor um, Sandoval is no longer there. You're with Governor Sisolak. But I've seen personally just that um, that continuation of bringing innovation. Can, so talk about Nevada. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, people know this, but, you know, Nevada was the uh, first state to uh, authorize deployment of uh, autonomous vehicles. Right. And so they're an early actor. They're, uh, you know, sending signs to industry, you know, hey, come invest in our state. We want to hear we want to hear from you. And this was you know, years ago. Um, and so taking that early action and really being uh, out in the forefront, I think, was very helpful for them to start the, the conversation early and really to, to get in early. Um, you know, I think through Governor Sisolak, uh, you know, through his economic development board, he has uh, done a great job to uh, provide incentives to companies that they want to attract. Um, and uh, and really help diversify that economy. Um, you know, we've been the benefit of that as well. Um, you know, there's and uh, you know, I think even at the the city level, um, you know, the the local community is just excited to to have kind of a new, fresh kind of a, a, a tech uh, be part of their communities. And uh, you know, they've just been all very welcoming of us. Uh, you know, we are uh, going on November 2nd out there to do the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, we invested $40 million into a manufacturing and a testing facility um, in the state that's going to produce 250 jobs uh, and what they estimate to be about $2.2 billion in economic impact uh, for the state. Um, and so, you know, we just see uh, um, that uh, the governor, we see uh, the, the local uh, stakeholders as well, really just taking uh, the right steps to to really attract us. Um, and I'd also add, I think uh, location really matters. Um, if you look at where a lot of the major testing is, I think Matt had that map up uh, early on. Uh, they've really had a great opportunity to take advantage of the California, Arizona, Texas area, where you see a lot of people making those investments uh, to really be uh, um, attract some of the manufacturing side uh, and jobs associated with it. No, that's great. Um, so we're at uh, 425 and I want one question for a quick round table. Um, and th it is a question in the chat, but it's something that we had talked about. You know, we are close to almost two years with COVID and the supply chain has definitely been in impacted. Businesses have been impacted. And so I want to just start with Milan and have him just maybe in a, in a minute, just how has, how has COVID impacted? What has it revealed for, for Wabtech? Uh, I think the, the turn off and on of the spigot of the supply chain kind of revealed its 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 vulnerabilities and in, in our context we saw you know this ability to to forecast and plan especially on the supply chain side you know how how our, our products could help our customers be ready to to, to take that dynamic um, 
movement in the supply chain as being as being a key piece, right? Um, as 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 you turn it off, and then you have to figure out, well, what am I going to do with these assets now that aren't being utilized, right? Uh, or uh, you know, do I need to have them there? No, maybe I don't need to have them at the port. As it comes back to, hey, I need to get these containers out. Where where are these type of um, you know vehicles to move move them out in? So being able to have um, a bit more intelligence and in, in to be able to predict and 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 ad adhere to these dynamic natures, I think, is one is one key thing that um, we identified as as a need and an opportunity to do better. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for for sharing that insight, Matt. I'm going to turn it over to you. What did the what did the the chamber learn about its kind of the region of of what was lacking? What did it reveal? Where um, you know to to southwestern Pennsylvania? Yeah, I re I would really go back to um, the earlier question. That's manufacturing, um, adding manufacturing jobs here, and the fact that you know if we really want you know any particular ecosystem or sector to be one that's shared by all. You know, we have to make sure that we're adding those manufacturing jobs, adding those large scale um, industrial jobs that, that we know exist. And that that will go, you know, particularly in this area uh, towards eliminating any of those supply chain difficulties into the future in the robotics, AV, AI space um, that we've talked a lot about here today. So for me, you know, it's really about creating the right policy environment, the right infrastructure uh, and having that in place so that we can locate some of those manufacturing uh, sites here in Western Pennsylvania. Great. And and Mike, I'll turn it over to you to uh, to talk about what did what did it reveal? What opportunities did it actually open up for Neuro? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we're contactless delivery, uh, and you know, coming to that's our sweet spot. Um, and I think that really uh, you know helps uh, kind of shine the light on what we were doing. Uh, and, and certainly create a lot of attention with some, uh, you know, very large you know, brand name companies. Um, you know, I think in the delivery space, we saw uh, growth already starting to happen before uh, the pandemic hit, but it just really, uh, uh, you know, I think if you look at Instacart shoppers in, in the grocery space, you know, like March of 2020, there was like 150,000. Uh, you go into the summer of 2020, there's 750,000. You know, that's a 5X uh growth just in a, a matter of months uh, to give you a feel for um, that just grocery uh, delivery. And uh, we think that that's going to stick. We, we don't think it's a, a, a kind of a blip or just kind of an up and then kind of goes back to normal. That growth is already happening. We think it's just accelerated and it's going to continue to stay at that level going forward. Yeah, I mean, grocery, I mean, I think maybe we've all seen this is that you go to the grocery store now and either there's not much there because there's these ginormous green like bins where online shoppers are coming in and, and shipping things out. So I think grocery is going to be an interesting, interesting one to watch. So um, now we have pretty much come to very much the close of our session. I have to read through some closing uh, remarks as a, as, a, as a thank you here. So let me just double check. And I know my friends at Michael Baker and PennDOT will keep me honest if I forget something. Um, no, I, it's really a, a big thank you for, for everybody to, to take the time today especially as we're in a virtual setting. If we were at the hotel, you know, at the Marriott that we're going to all be at in 2022, right? I would have to read that off. Um, so we will come try to come back and be in person here in, in the next, uh, next year. Um, but, you know, as we are doing that, let's, let's hope that we can all stay safe and we can engage together. We appreciate everything um, that you all are doing to advance this technology safely. And we hope you enjoyed this session today.